Welcome back to our, our study in Revelation. I, this will be the last time I'll be able to say that because we've come to the end of our journey. Uh, this Today we're going to be covering chapter 21 and 22, which will close out Revelation. This is the 19th video for this. Um, now, if you've watched the first 18, 18 of these videos and you're now here watching the 19th, uh, then let me just say that you are an example of, of someone who models the call of Revelation, which is to endure patiently through suffering. I understand that, and I appreciate you being here through all of this, and it's been my prayer all along that uh, there'll be something said, something about this, uh, this vision that, that will encourage you uh, and that uh, it will bless you in some way. So uh, hopefully that's been the case. And uh, I, I have to think here toward the end, I always in my mind wonder what the uh, emotions might be for those that are hearing this for the first time. You know, those seven letters, uh, someone sitting in Ephesus or, or Smyrna or Philadelphia or Laodicea, they, sitting there and hearing this for the first time, and now they've got toward the end of the vision, it's just about over. And I wonder what's going through their mind because it was a, uh, it was a mixed message to be sure. There was some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that, that things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Uh, that's never uh, pleasant to hear. But then there's also the good news. The good news is that God is in control. And God knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what they're going through. And He will put an end to it. That's why the vision was given to reassure them that He is with them. Uh, Jesus is there and, and He will help them through this and it will come to an end. Uh, and so the last scene, uh, the last scene that we'll look at today is really just a, a real crescendo of, of joy and, and peace and security uh, that, they can, that they can look forward. He keeps telling them to patiently endure the hardship, but it's going to come with a great reward. So he's going to focus on the reward at the end. And, and as, they, as they leave the theater after the movie's over, hopefully we'll be uh, ready to go and ready to face the trials ahead because of what's, what's down the road uh, when they're victorious. So with that in mind, before we get started into chapter 21, uh, let's take a moment and, and pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this great vision that you gave to John and that's been preserved for us. Uh, we're thankful for the blessing that it brings us and for the encouragement that it gives us and for the confidence that gives us knowing uh, that you have always been on the throne. You're from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, you, you rule. And it reminds us, Father, of your love and, and the great future that we have to look forward to because of that love and because of the love of Jesus and what he did on that cross. And Father, may, uh, may this study deepen our faith and deepen our trust in you and help us to endure patiently anything that comes our way for your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to start reading Revelation 1, the first eight verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, or for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, um, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of, of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now this imagery here, um, comes out of, of a couple of different places. It comes out of, of Isaiah and it also comes out of Second Peter. And I would like to take a minute and, and look at, at both of those very quickly. First of all, in, in Isaiah, 
Uh, you can read chapter 65 and 66. I'm only going to pick a couple of verses, uh, one verse out of 65. And then also in, in chapter 25, there's more there. But, but just to give you a taste of this, it says, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Um, and then in 25, 8, it says, He will swallow up death. He being God will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe uh, away the tears from all faces. So see that imagery comes out of Isaiah and there God is speaking of delivering the people out of bondage uh, to, uh, to uh, Babylon. Um, the wording is, takes, take, would take them back to that, to that scene where, where they had been delivered. And in Revelation uh, we have seen repeated over and over again that Rome being referred to as Babylon. It's the, it's the new Babylon. So it's telling the audience here that just as uh, Israel was delivered out from bondage of, of the Babylonians. So Rome, you, the, the saints are going to be taken out of the bondage of, out of the persecution under that they were experiencing under Rome. So that's the uh, that's the topic on that. Now let's move over to the other in the New Testament where this new heaven and new earth is referred to and look at it. Second uh, Peter three twelve and thirteen. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth with right, where righteousness dwells. Now here, uh, this is obviously talking about the second coming, and this is talking about heaven. The first was talking about deliverance, and that ties these three verses, the one in Revelation, and, and then now in Peter, and then those in Isaiah, kind of tie those all together and, and show this new heaven and new earth can be used different ways. It can be in, in talking about deliverance, or it could be talking about heaven itself. And I think uh, it, it really is, is talking about both because I think it, it ties all this together, that God is going to continue to deliver throughout all of time. Um, and so what we'll have now, is, is I think God is reassuring them and reassuring us that He, he is going to continue uh, to deliver uh, through all, all of history. In fact, the final delivery will be when He delivers all of the saints from this, this sin-soaked, fallen world that we live in and he brings an end to it. That will be the final delivery. But this is a repeated thing over and over again. And now the scenes that follow this will be are going to describe the, uh, the glory and the beauty uh, that, uh, that life, the, the life that, that awaits those that are victorious, those that remain faithful, how, what they can expect and how life is going to be. And it's going to be a glorious thing. So we move now to look at that, and to do it, we will examine a little bit about this uh, new heaven and new earth. First thing that we notice about it, uh, the first thing said, is that the sea is gone. Now you remember that, that sea, we were introduced to that way back in chapter 4, and it, that sea is that reservoir where all of the evil was, and that's where the conflict took place. It was before the throne of God, and He was sitting up on His throne, He was watching the conflict that was there. And the saints were said to go through that, and that was called their tribulation. They went through that tribulation and got through it to the other side where God was on the throne, and they immediately began to worship Him, if you remember. That's also the sea is where the, the beast and the uh, false prophet came out of this sea, and Satan pulled them out and uses them as his ally to try to defeat and destroy the church. Um, so there is no more sea now in the sea. So now it, the sea is gone. The reason it's gone is the conflict's gone. All the enemies are gone. They've all been taken care of in the vision. So there's no more need for that. And he is the one on the throne. God is making everything new. Um, what that means is that uh, the pain and the suffering and the hunger that they experienced, the prejudice, you remember the lies that were told about them that caused them so much, so much problem and so much prejudice against them in the communities, uh, that's all gone now. Uh, there's no more of that. It's a totally different world that they live in now where they are, where they have no needs, where everything is provided for them, they're taken care of, and they have just the glory of God there. And he's saying that you can count on it. <clears throat> this is uh, this is reliable. Remember, they're hearing this before it happened. Uh, they're they're getting this picture now of of the end, but really, in their life, it hasn't really started yet. So once it starts, 
and this thing begins to get more intense, no doubt there's going to be times that they will wonder. And they'll say, well, maybe we misunderstood something. I thought it was going to get, you know, eventually he would take care of it. What, what's taking so long? And, and so he's reassuring him again that uh, they just need to wait on him, but he, he w is in control. And he makes this statement there that he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And that's just a way of saying that, that God is God. He always has been and he always will be. He's always been on the throne, always been in total control of the plan that he has to redeem his creation from the very start to the very end. And then verse 7 and 8, he's, he, he tells uh, those, that are, that, those that are victorious, uh, that are, they'll be the faithful ones, they're going to experience an incredible life. And um, those that are lured away by, by Satan and his lies and are drawn away, and uh, they they will also experience life too but it's going to be in the fire so there's those are the only choices it's either going to be bliss or fire and you have to decide which of those it's going to be this is another call to faithfulness uh, they've done he's done that all through revelation in fact that's probably the central theme of revelation uh, not just that that god's going to win but calling the saints to be faithful be patient and endure that's the big message um, and now he's going to reveal this holy city uh, that they are going to live in. And we're going to take a look at that from, from different angles here. Um, <coughs> the holy city is verse 9, <coughs> excuse me, verse 9 through 11. And let me, um, let me read that. But before I do, let me point out that when you, when you read here, uh, Bride of Christ, as you go through Revelation, read about the bride, or read about, and you see New Jerusalem, or a ho the holy city, all of those things are metaphors for the church. So you can substitute the church in each one of those and not change the meaning at all. That's the topic here as we go along. So let me, let me read verse 9 through 11. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like, like a jasper, clear as crystal. So now we're getting a look at the church, but we're looking at it a little different. We've seen the church from the very beginning in, in the first, second, third chapter where we got those uh, seven letters. But the church there we saw was, uh, had a lot of flaws, uh, had a lot of weaknesses. There were a lot of struggles uh, in that church, but now it's totally different. Now we're seeing the church from God's perspective. It's coming out of heaven. And we're seeing the church as God sees the church. And he has great love for this. And he has great things in store for this church moving forward. And so that's what we're gonna see now. We're gonna see that everything is perfect. This is really a, a vision of the, of the complete and, and perfect uh, a church. And so we start out by seeing the, uh, the, it is perfectly designed. And that's verses 12 through 17. I'll not read those, but I'll just kind of highlight those. And as you read through, take a look and, and notice that it talks about gates and foundations, the shape of it and the wall around it. Those are all the topics there. And, and it shows that it's perfectly designed. The, the gates, there's 12 of them. And on those 12 are the names of the, um, of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then you have the foundations. <clears throat> I guess I should say the gates, I, it'd be fitting, I think it's the 12 tribes of Israel because gates are those first things that you first get into when you're getting into a city. Well, in, in, in history, you know, God's plan of redemption started out with, with, this, with his God's chosen people and he had Israel and, and they, were, they were the gates, they were the ones that started the movement uh, toward the church and toward Jesus. And then when you get inside the city, you've got the foundations. And there's 12 foundations, and their names on those as well, and they're the 12 apostles. And the foundation of this, uh, of this new city, this church, the foundation is the gospel. Uh, it's God's plan of redemption. So that is the very foundation of it. The shape of it, it's, it's in a perfect cube. Now, there is nothing any more stable than a perfect cube. So it, it, it speaks to its strength and its stability. And then um, it says that it's... 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 stadia. Now, if you look up what a stadia is, that will tell you that it's about 1,400 miles in every direction. Uh, width, length, and height, all about, about uh, uh, 
1,400 miles. It's an enormous city, enormous city. One that would be, uh, no way could anyone defeat a city uh, like that. It would be invincible because of the size. And then a wall around it, the wall is 144 cubits, which means it's about 200 feet thick. Enormous wall as well. It, it's speaking to these folks that they, that they are totally and completely secure in this city. Now, and then it talks about the city being measured. Um, that image comes out of chapter 11. You remember John was given that rod and he was told to, to measure the temple. And we said then in that lesson that, that the idea of measuring was just saying that, that God was in complete control and he knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly who they were. He knew his, who his uh, followers were, those that loved him. He, he was totally aware of every aspect of this. And it, it was a repeat of an earlier one because you go back to chapter seven, that's where all the saints are numbered. Same, the same meaning, it's a different image, but tells the same story. God knows who you are. Nobody's gonna be left behind. Now, that, that may not be such a big deal for us to think about worrying about somebody being left behind, but, but that, was a, that was a concern in the, in the early church, uh, in the first century. You remember when, um, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, he deals with that. Because they were worried, what happens, what happens if these, these saints die before Jesus comes back? You know, they were worried that he might, they might be left out or they may not receive the same reward. And this is just reassuring them. Uh, nobody, nobody's going to be left out. Nobody's going to be missed. Uh, you can count on it. Those that, if, if you're called to die for the Lord, then die for the Lord. You will get great reward for that and you will, you will not miss anything. So that was a big deal to them, for them to hear that. And then also another thing to notice here is the use of the number 12. Um, you know, in the numerology, the Hebrew numerology that, that this style of writing uses, all the numbers don't tell you quantity. They give you some, some meaning uh, about the vision. Uh, and, and that's what's happening here. The number 12 is the number for God's people. So all along you look and you see that there are, you know, that there are 12 gates and 12 foundations and the shape of it is 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 and the wall is 144 cubits, which is 12 times 12. So everything has to do with 12. This is a way of saying this is, this is God's city that he's prepared for his people. Uh, you know, this, this is the church. It was built by Jesus. It's protected by the Holy Spirit, and sitting on the throne ruling over it is the God, Lord God Almighty. So, you know, there is complete and absolute stability, and it's perfectly designed. And it's also perfectly glorious. Um, it's made of only the finest and most expensive materials. Uh, you read down through 19 through 21. It, it expresses the, uh, the glory and the beauty and the great value of this bride, the church. Now, John has a bit of a problem here, I think. He, he's trying to describe the way God sees his church, and he's also trying to describe what God has in mind for his church in the future. And, he, and he's really, no doubt, is in a bind here. And I, I, think, I think Paul says something uh, in, in 1 Corinthians that gives us some insight into what probably the big problem for, for John would be. Because in, in 1 Corinthians 2.9, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. You see, the, the problem is, in describing all of this, is our minds are too small. Uh, we're talking about God and what God has in His mind. And, and so we really don't have the ability to quite comprehend that. Have you ever had a, a friend maybe talking about a movie or a restaurant or something and, and just just goes on about how great it is and says, you know, that it, it's to die for. I've heard that expression. I don't particularly like that expression, but but it, it, you, you know what it means. It said, oh, that's to die for. That just means you can't get any better than that. That's, that's just incredib incredibly good. And then you go out and you try it. You watch the movie or you go to the restaurant or you whatever it is, and you give it a try and you think, hmm, Man, they must not think much of their life if that's, they're willing to die for something like this because that's not, that was, you were real disappointed. It wasn't what you thought that it might be. Well, that's not gonna happen here. When we're talking about heaven, you don't have to worry about that. You can let your imagination run wild and, and what is heaven like? Everybody wants to know. Well, what can you imagine? What's the greatest thing you can imagine? Well, let, let me tell you for sure, you, you haven't even touched the hem of the garment yet. 
you're not even close to what it really is because it is so much greater than anything that we can even imagine. I kind of think about uh, uh, in Second Chronicles 9, you know, that's where you had the Queen of Sheba going to see Solomon. She had heard what a great kingdom he had and all those things, and she couldn't hardly imagine that it would be that good, so she had to go check for herself. You remember what she said after she was there a while? She said the half hadn't been told. She was, she was blown away with it. Well, I think that's what it is. When we're talking about heaven, we're going to be blown away. When we see it, whatever we had in mind, we, it just be blown out because this is nothing like what we can even imagine. And so John is now trying to explain that. He's trying to give them some sense of, uh, of what heaven's like. So all he can do is take these items that are the rarest and the most expensive and the most beautiful things in the world that they're, they're familiar with that are, that are just the greatest and use them to describe it, even though they're just a shadow of what it's really going to be. It's going to be an amazing place. And now we move forward to the holy city is also perfectly provisioned. It's interesting here because to make this point, it's not so much what they have, it's what they don't have. And the reason is that because the one thing they do have is, is God on the throne. And with that, you don't need anything else. And that's the point. You've got God and the Lamb that are there. And they keep referring to the lamb here instead of saying Jesus. And the reason is because it was the work of him as a lamb being sacrificed that made all this possible. And so now with those on the throne, you don't need anything else. You don't need a temple. You don't need the lights. You don't need the gates closed. Let's go down through that. That's verses 22 through 27. But it says the temple, you don't, you, there's no need for the temple because God and, and the lamb are the temple. Uh, this speaks to the intimacy of the relationship that we'll have with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in this, in this new city uh, that we have now in it and that also ultimately in its perfect form we'll have later, uh, which we call heaven. Um, in, the, in, the old, in the old city, uh, before this, there was a temple. And, and in that temple was a holy of holies, and that holy of holies is where God was. But people didn't have access to that. Uh, it, was, it was a separate room and there was a curtain there. And it wasn't until Jesus died on that cross that that curtain was torn. What that meant was it gave us access. Now we would have access to God where it would be a much more intimate relationship. That's why the relationship is referred to as, as a bride and, and uh, as a groom and a bride because it's a marriage relationship. Uh, the two became one. God lives in us and we live in God. It's a different relationship. So that's why there, there's no temple there because we're together. And then there's no need for any exterior light, no sun or moon, no need for that uh, <clears throat> because they provide the light. Now in the New Testament, light is a, is a metaphor for what? Truth. See, so, so that's what this is talking about here. There's absolute and complete truth in this city, and there's great light, and, and so there's no need for, for anything, any other light to come in there. Uh, <clears throat> in the old city, there was some light, but in the old city, if you look at Hebrews 10, it said it was just a shadow, Hebrews 10, 1. It was just a shadow of what was coming. So there was some light there, but it was not nearly as clear. This is bright, brilliant, perfect light all the time. And there's no need to shut the gates because there is no night. If, if constantly light, there's no darkness. And that's when evil comes, and that's when dangers come. There's no dangers, there's no evil. Leave the gates open, there's no reason to shut them because you've got the Holy Spirit there guarding it, and you've got perfect light, perfect truth, and you're perfectly secure. No, nothing is gonna get, enter the gates that don't belong. No evil is gonna be there. And then we see that, that this, this church is superior to anything else on earth. Um, in, the, in the verses, um, verse 24 and 26, it makes mention of the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Um, <clears throat> that, that particular verse, I think, is referring back to one of the, the ancient um, uh, policy of when one nation defeated another nation, then the one that had been defeated would bring gifts and tribute in to the city and, and show their respect to the ones that, are, that were the victors and accept the fact that they, were, they had been defeated and that uh, they would be ruled over by the others. 
and, and they're not part of the city, but they're just showing the respect. And I think that's what uh, this is a, a, a vision of, that all the earth, everything on earth will eventually bow down to, to Jesus and to the church. Um, Isaiah 45, verse 23 and 24, uh, four. Let me let me read that verse again. I say Isaiah 45, 23 and 24. You might want to look that one up. And there God saying, Before me every knee will bow. By me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, In the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him, against God, will come to him and be put to shame. You know, Paul, Paul quotes that or, or paraphrases that he, in his uh, letter to the Romans in 10. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And I think that's the image here that, of, the, of this church, all these nations coming in. And, uh, and notice he, the, this city is what provides the light for those nations. Whether they believe it or not, the only light in this world, the only light in our world today is the church and God's word. That's the, that's the only real truth. And anything that's not consist consistent with that is a lie. So it provides that, and they'll, uh, someday they will all realize it's, that it was true. And that's good news for these, uh, these saints, too, that are going through the persecution, because they want to know how long before we'll be vindicated. You know, our blood, and they've been martyred for Jesus. And, and how long will it be before the truth is known? And, and he's saying, this, this is it. You know, the truth will be known. The truth will win, and the lies are going to be exposed. And there's nothing on earth as important as the church. Um, and the only ones that will be a part of this, the only ones that can live there are those that have their name in the book of life. And so that's the requirement to, to be able to live in that city. And then it's going to be perfect uh, forever. It's not something that's going to be good just for a short period and gone. No, it, it, it's an eternal thing. And we get to chapter 22 now. <clears throat> and 22, part of this 22, the first five verses, if you want to go back and look to Ezekiel 47, you can find in the Old Testament there some more vision that's similar to this. It's amazing how many times in Revelation it sends us back to the Old Testament and looking. I think God's making a statement. He's saying, look, I've handled this all along. I've handled all the problems all along throughout all of history. You can trust me with the future. Don't worry about it because we, we are going to be, uh, be faithful at the end. If we're faithful to the end, then, that's, then we will receive this great reward. So now let's look in uh, 22, <clears throat> the first five verses there. And we're going to see that, we, that this all comes from the throne of God. That's the first thing to notice. Where does this originate? Everything starts with this living water, and it's flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. So everything, everything good in this city, they're the source of it. And, the first, and you have the river <coughs> of the living water that flows down through the middle of the city. Uh, living water, that's, uh, again, a metaphor for Jesus. I remember the conversation that he had with the woman at the well in, uh, in John chapter 4. And then there's a tree of life there, uh, but there's two of them. In the Garden of Eden, there was only one. There's two here on each side of the river, and it provides everything that's needed, and it's, it will provide eternity, uh, all that's needed. Now, the imagery here in these, first, uh, these verses in, in chapter 22, the imagery is certainly of Eden, the Garden of Eden. And then you have the crops there, and these crops they never they never fail. Um, they're uh, month after month they keep producing their crops. So there's never going to be any need. There's never going to be uh, any droughts or or lack of food. There'll be plenty to eat, plenty to drink, eternal water to dr and to drink. And then the crops that will be continuously coming. And then it mentions the leaves. Uh, now that's an interesting story too. I think the leaves are for healing. And, and we immediately think of healing. We probably think of the, the spiritual healing, the healing of sin. Uh, you know, this is, this is a picture where there is no sin. Uh, they're, they're already, their names are already in the book of life and they're in this city. So that's, I don't think, the point. I think the point is, uh, has to do more with the medical uh, situation. You know, the uh, medical science at this point was really primitive. And health was a very precarious thing uh, in that day and time. And if you were poor, it was even more precarious. Uh, it was it was something. If you had enough money, you might get some help. But if you didn't have much money, you were just you. It was just uh, difficult for you to keep good health. There was a lot of disease, a lot of illness, and and there wasn't much you could do about it. And most of these saints were very poor because of the economic persecution that they they had to go through. 
So this would have been a very encouraging thing. You say, not only are you provided everything else, but you're going to have great health. You're never going to get sick. You're never going to get sick in heaven. You know, there's not going to be any illnesses. There'll be no cancer wards. You know, there'll, there'll be none of, no hospitals. None of that will happen. None of that will be available. There'll be no need for that. So it's going to be perfect, and it will be, uh, they are uh, perfect for eternity. And then not only that, it mentions in three things in these, uh, in these last few verses. It's, uh, verse 3 says, no longer will there be any curse. There's no sin. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. It's talking about God. So again, this is, this is the Garden of Eden. We're, we're back to the garden here because there's no sin there. We have a relationship with God uh, that's not behind barriers, uh, not distant, very close. Just like Adam and Eve from the very beginning, they walked with God and they talked with God. Uh, you know, they, it was face-to-face -face relationship that they had, and this will be there forever. They'll reign forever and ever. Now, notice there's something curious here, I think, and, and that is that God's Word starts in a garden, the Garden of Eden. That Genesis, that's where we, we start out in a garden. Now we've come to the very end, the very last book of the Bible, and we're closing it out. There'll be no more inspired books after this, after this vision. And where do we end up? Back in the garden. It's perfect bookend. The Genesis and Revelation are a bookend. They start at the same place. It starts and ends at the same place. And from the very beginning, what messed up that, that first garden was sin. Man did that, and as a result, they left the garden. And as soon as that happened, God immediately began on His plan to redeem His creation because He loved them. And so He started the entire Bible from Genesis 3, 15, when they're kicked out of the garden. From that point on, it's all about restoring it. And here we are at the end of Revelation, the last bit of the, the last scene of our movie, and we're back in that garden again. God's done it. God has come up with the plan, He's executed the plan, and now there's access once again, and we can get back to the garden. But the second garden is better than the first. That's why He's making all things new. He's, when He makes it new, He makes it even better. And how is it better? There'll be no snakes. There'll be no snakes. Serpent will not be in this garden. So there'll be no danger of that happening again. And so with that, he gives us a prologue which closes out, uh, closes out the book. <laughs> and the, pro uh, the prologue here, just very quickly, uh, uh, it, it, as you read through um, uh, 20, uh, 12 through 21, uh, he, he says that the, what you read here, what, this vision that you're given, is absolutely reliable. You can count on it because it's God that gave it to you. He also makes a point that it's very urgent. This is for you. He reminds them again, it, it, it's the end of this, that this is an urgent message for you. Notice in verse 6, he says it's soon that it will happen. In verse 7, coming soon. In verse 12, coming soon. In verse 20, coming soon. And then in verse 10, he says, don't seal this up. He tells John, don't seal it. Now that goes all the way back to Daniel 12 in his vision. When he had his vision, he was told, seal it up because it's a long time coming. John says, don't seal it. Why? Because it's coming soon. Now, what's coming? That persecution. And, and Jesus is saying uh, He's going to be coming soon, too. Uh, and His coming soon is not talking about the second coming. It's talking about assuring them that when this persecution comes, He's not, he's not going to leave them as orphans. He's not going to leave them alone to face it. He's going to be right there with them. And He's going to be part of that. He'll, he'll protect them, and, and He'll be there for them uh, all the way through this. So it's assuring them. He, in, verse, in chapter 1, you remember He saw Jesus coming on the clouds. That wasn't the second coming. He was just telling Him, here, here I come. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you through this. Um, He's not going to leave us alone. And we often pray for Jesus to come soon, don't we? Uh, we, we may not be praying necessarily that He come soon in the second coming, but we, may, but we ask Him to come soon when we have illnesses and we have troubles and we have trials, and we'll pray to God and ask for relief. We're asking Him to, to come in that sense, come and, and take care of the situation. And that's, that's the kind of uh, thing that He's mentioning here. So verses 12 through 17, it's, an, it's another... Uh, we see there another. Um, uh, we see another call to faithfulness in verse 12 through 17, reminding them again to be faithful. And he says there to come. He's calling the people to come. And who is he calling? 
uh, anybody that will listen because Jesus, God is always calling people to come to him and, and not be a part of the of the Satan's army, the one that will end up in the fire. He continues, he, all these rewards that he has, he wants to give to everybody and that's his goal. So he's right up to the very end. He's saying, come, you know, come be a part of this. Come take this water. You know, if you come to me, then this, this living water is available to you. And then he gives this, uh, ends up with a warning, and that warning is not to add to or to take things away from this prophecy. Now, um, we go back to the first seven, those seven churches and the letters that we had. One of the things that they were warned against repeatedly is don't compromise. Um, don't, don't compromise with the enemy. You can't hang on to some of the world and some of God. It's one or the other all the way through. It teaches us that. So, so don't, don't compromise. Now, whenever we have the, uh, a desire to compromise, when that things start looking like maybe the solution would be to give in just a little bit, like I'm sure that happened to them through all those persecutions. Well, realize what's happening there because satan is working on the on the mind of you at that point and what he's doing is using one of his favorite tools and one of his more effective tools and that's called rationalization because he knows that we can rationalize almost anything and we can rationalize it and make anything we want to do look right and we can even give it a noble face put a happy face on it because we're good at that and um, this this scripture here don't add anything don't take anything away i think is a warning not only for them but for anyone who picks up god's word and reads it don't when you read god's word you've got to be honest you can't look at it and rationalize it to make it fit what i want to do that's warning you against doing that when you look at god's word you've got to look at what it says and the only change that needs to be made is the change that you need to make in order to conform what the word wants you to do and we've got to be honest with it and do it that way and so he challenges them to do that um, and that brings us to the end the movie's over <clears throat> now on your way out make sure you pick up your candy wrappers and your popcorn uh, boxes and, and throw them in the trash can on the way out because keep the theater clean. The movie's over. And um, as it comes to the end, I, I think as you walk out of the theater and as you give this the, pic, uh, the movie, uh, you consider it, don't, don't forget to see the big picture. You know, when you go to a movie, when you come out, there's always one or two things that that movie told you. Make sure that you keep the picture, what was big, what was obvious, uh, and those things that were encouraging. Um, things like patient endurance. You know, that, that's been a theme all the way through it. Through it. And, and then also things like um, uh, that God is mighty. He's stronger than any enemy that, we f that we'll face. He's got all the strength and he's in total control. God is still on the throne. And so trust him because he's the only one that can be trusted. And we see he, he's reminded us so many times through Revelation how he's handled the past. And he did that for a purpose, to show us that he can handle the future. So don't worry about the future. Just trust in God. Stay close to him. The closer to God we are, the more it blesses us. Um, and, and you can think of a, a lot of others. I've written some others down in here. Um, but, but you could go through and think of the big pictures. Uh, I, they're not hard to understand. Uh, the, um, the visions are easy. And the main thing is, as you go through, keep it simple. Try not to get it too complicated. I don't think it's a complicated message. It's told in this form because it wasn't to teach any new theology. It was just to encourage and to help you see the theology you'd already been taught and apply it to the struggling times that you're going through. And we're going through struggling times, so we need the encouragement as well. Trust God, that's the main, that's the main message. Well, it, we've come to the end. I want, to, I want to thank you for being patient with me through this. And I also want to thank you for uh, the kind words that, that uh, you have sent my way. Some have called, uh, some have emailed, but uh, I, I appreciate that uh, very much. And I do hope that, that somehow that this, uh, this effort has blessed you. I, I've said from the very beginning, I do not at all consider myself an expert on Revelation. In fact, I consider myself a student. I'm still learning. I'm still trying to pick up things. Uh, not everything in there is, makes perfect sense to me, but the, but the big picture does. And, and that's all that really matters. So let me just leave you with this. Um, that I, I, just, I just pray that, uh, that you will continue to search God's Word and you continue to, uh, uh, to seek Him in everything that you do. And I'd like to say then, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and, and be gracious to you. 
And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.